listings tonight. Um, we're really excited because Catherine and I have quite a soft spot for rosé, um, but not just enjoying it. We're really excited to explore the variety that rosé has to offer so that we hope that you are too. We have got a couple of ways you can interact with us this evening. If you'd like to tell us, I can already see a few people now saying where they are and what they're drinking. Please feel free to use the chat. Uh, we've also got a Q&A button and the Q&A button is great for asking questions. We'd prefer it if possible if you didn't put the questions in the chat. It's just easier for us to find them in the Q&A. Of course, don't worry if you can't use it. Then most importantly, if you are having any technical problems, we've got somebody, Tim, behind the scenes manning the emails. So if you email tastings at thewinesociety.com, then you will be able to get a response and work out why the tech isn't isn't going your way this evening, but fingers crossed it is. Uh, there are a few things going my way, one of which is the weather. I, it was supposed to rain and I thought, oh, it's such a shame Catherine and I are going to do an evening of rosé in the rain. It's not a bad thing, you know, rosé is not just for the sunshine, but I have to say I've got a little bit of sun poking through and it means that everything looks absolutely gorgeous and all these really, really pretty rosés are looking their best. Um, so... I know that uh, many of you have bought the mixed case for this evening. Don't worry if you haven't. This evening's designed to just show you some examples of rosé. There's loads we've had to miss out, um, but it will show you some examples of rosé. I'm going to do a little bit of history and background and a bit. We're going to do a bit of production, aren't we, Catherine? But without going too sciencey. It's Thirsty Thursdays. It's not science lesson, so uh, we won't go too much. But it is important to know how your wine's made and where it comes from, because it has such an important uh, impact on the flavour. Um, but what we would advise, if you have or haven't already, don't worry, it's not the end of the world. I'm actually committing, in my opinion, a bit of a cardinal sin, because I've got all six wines, and by the time I get, unfortunately, to the final wines, they will be a bit warmer than I'd like them to be. If you would like to um, enjoy them at their best, I would pop the final three wines in the fridge. So if you are drinking all six with us or tasting all six with us this evening, the rosé is our first wine, the Muga is the second, all of this was in, in the original email, and the Mugga is the third. I'd have those out and have the rest in the fridge and we will give you a little, um, a little pause, a little pause uh, to go and grab the other three. But like I said, I'm committing the sin. If you want to commit the sin and have all six ready to go, then no worries. Um, oh, I'm glad to see we've got some people sat outside doing this. That was the plan, wasn't it? <laughs> that was the hope, Catherine. Um, but yes, so we will be clear which rosé we're talking about uh, as and when we're talking about it. So hopefully if you do have any of them or a selection of them, then it will be clearer um, at the time. And this is being recorded. So if you decide you like the sounds of a rosé and you want to go back to it, then you can um, watch the recording on YouTube afterwards with the new bottle that you've decided to get your hands on. So without further ado, Catherine, yeah. are we ready to crack on? We are indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I thought I'd do a tiny bit of history of rosé, mainly because um, I think most people think that rosé is potentially a new style of wine. It's certainly, um, and I'll go on to, to trends in a moment, it's certainly changed, it's a bit of a leopard that changed its spots, but the history of rosé, actually rosé is a very, very old classical traditional wine. Um, if you think back to when, when vineyards were first planted, very rarely would you have a whole vineyard of, let's say, Pinot Noir of a certain clone like you do now. There wasn't the science to understand that. So you'd have a mixed bag, what's called a field blend. And often those would be grapes with red skins and grapes with white skins. And those are the two main types of grapes. So you'd chuck them all in, you'd ferment them together. And just by blending them, white and red skins in the very nature, you would make rosé. So um, of course, that's the classic. Uh, that's the original rosé style. Um, it's It's been around for yonks. Um, the Brits, if that's what we want to talk about, I'm going to flash up a picture quickly, but the Brits are um, famed, shall we say, for their love of rosé. And I'm just going to show you one quick photo, if you bear with me a mo, which if I say photo, it's definitely not a photo. Um, we have got a uh, a little shot of a 
a lovely scene here. This is Eleanor of Aquitaine and this is what would become King Henry II on their wedding, I believe, or certainly on a ceremony of sorts. Um, and when Eleanor of Aquitaine in 1152, and you'll have to check my history on that, it could be 54, uh, when this union was created, uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine essentially was on the west, she, she, her kingdom was the west coast of France, and the wines of Bordeaux and the Loire suddenly were accessible to England. They were being shipped straight to England and we were enjoying them. So we were enjoying that particular style of rosé called claret. And I've got an example of a claret here, which is a very, very dark rosé uh, made in a particular method that Catherine's actually going to talk about in a bit. But this particular wine, this claret, is described as a pale red wine. In modern day times, we call it a rosé, but it was a pale red wine and there's plenty of evidence of us Brits enjoying this claret style right from that, uh, that early time. Now, it's worth saying, just as a little tidbit or a fact, that's actually where the word claret comes from. So red Bordeaux is often called claret these days, and that is where, where that term comes from, from this claret. Um, at the beginning, after that, at the beginning of the 20th century, pale, these pale reds made up 10% of our production. Um, at, of all wine production in France. In the 1950s, champagne, pink champagne, I should be specific, became very fashionable, as did rosé d'Anjou. So those were two new styles of rosé in the mix. And in the 1990s, there was this emergence of what we now know and love as a pale Provence style. So in the 1990s, this started to come about. And a lot of people say that 2007 in particular, when uh, production was at its highest, was the real turning point. So uh, what are the trends that we're seeing today? And I'll quickly touch on three, three really quick ones. Um, one is that rosé is pop more popular than ever. The global rosé production uh, grew from 20 million hectolitres, and that's a lot of wine already, in 2002 to 26.4 million in 2018. So that's an increase of around 31%. Um, the second, so the first trend is just, it's getting more popular. The second trend is that rosé has really turned from being sold as a wine to being marketed as a bit of a lifestyle. And that's not always true, but there, there have been groups of, of rosé producers who very much targeted um, you know, sunshine wines or, or seaside. I think there's even a French company that have coined the term poolside rosé and made it a legal thing. Um, it's in French, but not in English. But um, so there's definitely rosé being sold based on fashion and style. And the third thing, the last thing that really is a different trend that we're seeing now is that pale is increasingly popular. Um, I've been in pubs in London where I've been stood next to somebody at the bar and they've literally said, can you give me the palest rosé that you've got? Um, pale is, is the thing. Um, I've also got a lovely little picture. I don't know whether, Catherine, you've got it up, but I have it if you don't, of a uh, some the rosé school or the rosé academy, I'll pop it up now, in Provence have this incredible, Van de Provence have these, this color chart. It's actually more extensive than this. There's about 20 different colors that you can have Provence rosé of. But color is a thing now. So um, yeah, massive, massive trend. Um, please start enjoying your first rosé as well. Don't wait for me to tell you about it, but I will be telling you about it in a second. But if you're getting thirsty, go for it. Um, but why has this pale, why, where's this pale trend come from? Um, and it's going to lead us beautifully onto the first wine. Well, um, largely it comes down to production, actually. So in the 1990s, um, this is the techie bit, uh, a, a type of press was invented. And traditionally, when you made rosé wine, and we'll go on to how it's made in a mo, um, but traditionally, when you made rosé wine, it was very easy for it to oxidise. Because one of the things that protects red wine from oxidation is the time it's spent on the grape skins and the grape skins give the wine their color. So without all of that color, um, they couldn't make pale wines because they would, just, they would just go bad so quickly. But in the 1990s, a pneumatic press was created that put a gas on top of, a, or on top of the wine so it didn't get oxidized in production. Um, and it meant that you could produce these really, really pale styles 
Um, it was called Inertis, the press, should you be interested. Um, but it basically was, it was the science and it was the production. And then a few people started doing it in the early 90s. There's a couple of producers that kind of landmarked it. Um, and it shut off from there. So it was just really not actually something that we were able to do without the science before now. So that leads me really nicely on to this wine because this is, and I'm just looking now, it is our playlist, our Provence this evening, if anyone's got a lovely colour chart like I do. Um, it is the playlist wine and it's made with a particular, uh, there's two ways that Provence, Provence wines are made. And the first production um, technique is, is called direct pressing. And I will be quick, I promise. And please, please, please taste and drink along whilst I'm, whilst I'm explaining. But this will provide a bit of a basis for the wines that we go on to. Essentially, um, most rosé is made with red grapes. And the red um, colour only is in the outside of the grape. So if you had the time, the energy or the inclination, you could actually peel a red grape and underneath is a clear berry. So white, red, doesn't matter what color, the inside of a grape by and large, most varieties is clear inside. It's just the skin that has the color. So when you press, uh, when, you, when you break the skins and get the juice out, direct pressing or vin, vin gris as it's often known in France as well, is you literally just press those berries and you get the juice out quickly and you get rid of those skins as soon as possible. And it means only a tiny bit of the juice touches those skins and the color comes out. So that's option one, direct press, the absolute light of the light, fresh berries, sort of uh, often your, your, your swimming pool wine. Um, then there's option two, which has a bit of a gradient. And I think, um, actually, I'll explain it and then we'll, we'll taste. But essentially what, what happens with this is you crush the berries a little bit. So a bit of juice comes out, but you're not juicing them as such. And then you let them sit, touch it. The juice sits with those skins, a bit like brewing a cup of tea. So it sits with those skins, but you don't leave it too long and you don't increase the temperature. You just let it sit there cold. I don't know whether anyone's ever tried to put a tea bag into cold water. Not much happens. Uh, and it's a little bit like that. You just leave those skins on there. For the lightest of lights, it might only be for two hours. For a little bit more color, you might go up to 20. Then you push, you press down, get the juice out. But by that point, it has got a little bit more color to it, like this one here. Um, and then at that point, you get rid of all those skins and those pips and things like that. So really, they were only two options in Provence. Um, and that's how this wine is made. This has had a very, very small amount of hours of skin contact at a really low temperature. So um, tiny, tiny amounts. This looks like a two hour job to me. It's got that beautiful pale color. Um, so I will tell you about this wine now. And obviously, all please do taste it. Um, it's from Provence, as I said, which is the uh, biggest rosé AOC in the world. So the biggest protected area to make, make rosé. 90% of the production of this area actually is rosé, which is, is amazing. Um, we have got, here we go, lovely, thank you, Catherine. Um, it does say on the um, chart, Sanso. Now I will let you know that it's 47% Sanso, but it's also got some Grenache, 39% and a touch of Syrah, 7%. Um, it's just that our, our computer system doesn't quite let us do blends accurately like that, but it is Sanso based. That is a very classic Provence blend. So Sanso tends to bring a quite floral character to wine. Most Provence wines that you find will have some Sanso in, not always, but Sanso is very, very popular. Grenache, also very popular. And as you go up towards the Rhone and the Rosé is there, and Catherine will go on to it soon, very popular. Um, other wines you might expect to find in Provence rosés are things like Mouverdre, which adds structure, um, a quite rare grape called Tiboren, which is very traditional, and that adds a bit of acid and, and floral notes as well. Um, and this particular wine is made by Chateau des Mesclans, and they are a lovely producer. We sell some of their other wines, um, a family-owned winery. They grow on a sort of schisty hillside soil. Um, they are quite traditional. I think we've got a picture of the winery, actually. I mean, if anybody's upset about not being able to travel, this is an evil thing to do to you because this winery is beautiful. Uh, there we go. Um, 
it's it's sort of um old traditional farmhouse but then they've got a very very traditional uh, sorry very modern winemaking facility with all the things I said that you need you know the inert press and keeping everything very cold and temperatures etc but yes have a smell if I'm sure you've you have already and I hope you have but you should get lovely floral notes a little bit of um salinity or or a, a kind of um mineral type thing and often Sanso can do that too but it's very gentle it's got a little bit of red fruits touch of strawberry maybe grapefruit as well grapefruit can be quite a common thing that comes through on Provence rosé it's worth saying that you can blend 10% of white grapes in but it has to be grapes you can't add white juice to make it paler they have to go into the press with the other grapes so it's a bit of a, yeah, bit of a misnomer. You can't cheat by adding white wine. And Catherine's going to go on to that in a bit. Well, we're both going to go on to that in a bit. But I hope you enjoy this wine. It's brand new for us. Marcel only bought it this year. Um, so it's brand new. We've been waiting to get an exhibition Provence Rosé for ages. But this is a great producer that we work with. So, yes, I hope you enjoy. And I'm going to hand whilst I take, well, Catherine, have you tried it? What you I think? have. I've just tried it. It's it's very delicate, isn't it? It's um, it's very much a wine that I would just want to sit in the garden. It's you saying about a bit of grapefruit. I also got a bit of um, red apple. It's very crunchy fruit, isn't it? Very bright, fresh, crunchy fruit. So it's, um, yeah, it's really pleasant. It's really refreshing and nice, quite different to some of the others that we're going to go on to. Yes, it is. I mean, it's a lovely introduction wine. And I think we said at the, orig at the um, original meeting we had about this, Catherine, this was the wine we wanted to start on because this mm. is the this is the wine probably a lot of people are familiar with. It's it's this is a good quality one, but, you know, you can you can get scales of Provence Rosé. But by and large, most decent pubs and restaurants will have one. And particularly last year when the summer was baking hot, this was kind of my this was my juice for the weekends. <laughs> Provence Rosé. Um, and then in terms of food pairings I actually don't necessarily need food with this so much but if I were going to have food um, I would keep it light and I'd keep it sort of aperitif style and um, there are Provence roses that bang a bit more weight than this one um, this isn't built this isn't built to um, it's not a wimpy wine but it's not built to be a food wine we'll go on to some of those later so if you were going to put something with it I would sort of go, yeah, crudités actually more than anything. Some hummus and and some and some vegetables would be lovely. So what we're going to do now, Catherine, aren't we? We're going to go on to you're going to do a pair. And for I members am. who are tasting yeah. along, it's the Muga and the Tavel, correct? Mm, indeed, it is. So got the the Muga and the Tavel, two very different colours. Let's hold up the bottles as well for you, just so you can see them in their entirety. We've got the Muga first and then the, the Tavel. So we're doing these ones as a pair because they do both have the predominant um, grape in the blend being Grenache. But it's very interesting to see how the winemaking um, makes them such a different wine to each other. So let's start with the Muga to kick off with. This is from the, so it's the Muga Rosada Rioja. And it's a blend of Grenache, Tempranillo, and some Viora. Now, Viora, you may be surprised to see that that is in here um, because that is a white grape variety. And if you're not familiar with the name, it's the Spanish term for Macabo. So as a white wine, it creates quite a nice aromatic floral um, wine, which is why it's used in this blend. It gives a little bit of lift. But as Anna was saying, you can't just mix a red wine and a white wine and, and end up with a pink wine. They do this blending of the juices before the fermentation. So it's um, it's not diluting the rosé. They make the rosé wine, they make the white wine, blend the juice and then let it ferment. Oh, Jeff and Jane have just put on about Tavel using the San Sanye method. We're going to get onto that in a moment, Jeff. We've Jane and some, Jeff have beaten you to it, Catherine. <laughs> well, we've had some discussion earlier today um, with Pierre, the um, buyer for Spain, and Jorge, the winemaker from Muga, as to whether the Sanye method is also used for this Rosado. 
Jorge is adamant that it isn't um, because with the Sanye method, usually that is a, a method where um, the lighter juice or the lighter run from the production of a red wine is bled off and then the rest of the juice and the skins are left to carry on and are produced into a red wine. However, with the Rosado, their whole intention is to always make a rosé. Um, and that really comes down to the real beginning of where they've planted their vines. They tailor the viticulture to keep the freshness and acidity of the Grenache and the Tempranillo. They want them to perform well for a rosé wine, not as a red wine that can make a rosé on, on the off chance that you've got some left over. So they have the vineyards on the northern slopes of the, the valley in Rioja. Um, keeps the temperature nice and um, sort of cool in the in the night times. There's a good diurnal temperature. So it's the cooler in the evening to keep that acidity fresh, keep the um, keep the ripeness of the, the grapes not going too high unnecessarily. They harvest quite quickly. Um, and keep them in a truck that is refrigerated to four degrees before transporting it to the winery where they press it straight away. And they do it in a, a soft and carefully managed gentle maceration. So that is similar to what Anna was talking about with the um, keeping the skins all in the juice and letting it uh, macerate to get the color and the tannin, a little bit of the tannin, there's a tiny bit of texture from the tannin, but more so the texture here is from the time it's spent on the fine leaves. Now the, the fine leaves are the dead yeast cells that are in the, um, in the production of the wine and they offer a really, a really nice sort of textural element. With this one, it adds a sort of nutty complexity, maybe like a little bit of almondy texture in there. And like I say, they blend the juices before fermentation which they then ferment at um, about 16 to 18 degrees for 15 to 20 days. And then it's on the lees for 12 weeks before being filtered and bottled for market. So it's a really, really nice one. There's a lot of concentrated fruit, even though you don't get it necessarily from the color, you wouldn't necessarily expect to get as much of a, a punch of the fruit as you do. You've got a really nice strawberry, cherry, bit of raspberry there. But there's also a, a little spicy touch, a little bit of white pepper, maybe a tiny bit of, of something like nutmeg that's quite warming. And then you've got the, the floral aromatic lift from the Viura as well. But it's, um, yeah, it's a really... And that's had like sunshine, but it's not absolutely. overcooked. It's yeah, really exactly. lovely, it bright red fruit. fruit. It's not overcooked at all. See some have been having it as well color wise Catherine for the the second in your pairing I mean it's, I know I mean it's it's, it's quite remarkable isn't it <laughs> when you see the difference I mean and then wow. it's predominantly the same the same grape but let's go on to the the Tarvel and we'll go on to that production method as well because as Jeff and Jane have highlighted and as we've, we've touched on it is a different method um which is I'll start with the method and then we'll, we can we can talk um, about the aromas and the, the flavour of the wine that you get. But it's a method most known as um, method Tavalois and it's a complete Sagné method. So as I was saying just a moment ago with the Sagné method of Sagné rosés, which is almost a rosé that's been made as a byproduct from the production of a red wine, the complete Sagné method or the method um, Tavalois is the same principle of leaving the skins in with the juice to, to macerate and um, really extract all that color and tannin, which is why it's, it's this color. But the juice is run off, it's bled off in its entirety. So there's nothing, nothing left at all. It does mean it's it's a slightly more of a, a gradual bleed off to just extracting the free run juice um, in say the direct pressing method. So you've got a, a bit of, it will then be blended sort of together um, 
you know, from, from the vats. So you have different levels and obviously depending on your harvest, it will depend on the um, resultant wine and what you're, you're aiming for. This is the Tavel Cuvée Prima Donna Rosé. It's a 2020 vintage and it's a blend of 60% Grenache and 40% Sanso. The Sanso offers a little bit more in the um, way of colour. It just adds that little bit of oomph to it. It's a very, it's what I would describe as a very robust wine. And it's one that I think perhaps if you weren't overly familiar with rosés, you would take a look at it and assume it's going to be quite sweet. It's not at all. This is a dry wine um, and it's got a lot of nice grip and structure from the tannin in there as well. A really nice thing about Tavel rosés is that they're a style of rosé that is suited to ageing. So Tavel, um, sorry, Domain maybe recommend that this one, you could age this for 10 years, 10 years or more, you know, and it's going to develop, it will get a little bit more of a dried fruit character to what it's got at the moment. And the the spice and the, the herbal qualities will really amp up as well. So this, I think it's quite a, it's quite, it's very red fruit dominant. Again, it's the strawberries, it's the, the cherries, but in comparison to the Muga, they taste to me almost cooked or baked, not stewed. It's not a stewed sort of fruit, but it's a real sort of concentrated intensity of the fruit there. And you've also got a little bit of the that sort of garrigue herbal kind of herb de Provence um, element there as well. So your woody herb, so a bit of thyme, a bit of rosemary, that offers a nice little bit of um, complexity and a little bit of astringency to the wine as well. So the Tavel is a AOC in the Southern Rhone and all the wines from Tavel are rosés. It's um, predominantly Grenache and Sanso like this blend is, although since um, 1969, Syrah and Mouvedra have also been uh, permitted. You can see on the map that it's it's right down there alongside, um, just underneath Lyrac, and just diagonally down from Chateauneuf de Pat. Now that's quite um, a good thing to take note of as well, because Domain may be there in the heart of the village of Tavel, and their vineyards have the same round pebbles, which is the, the Gaillette rule, which are found in Chateauneuf de Pape. Those are very important. So they conserve the heat during the day and then they'll um, restore it slowly back into the soil during the night, which helps these grapes. So the Grenache and the Sanso, particularly with the Sanso having a slightly thicker skin, it will help them achieve that ripeness and an even ripeness across the, across the whole harvest. The individuality and the typicity of a Tavel Rosé is in the structure and how fruity it is. And that is really well shown here with Domain Maybe. Richard Maybe, who is the um, the winemaker there, that's something that he really wants to, um, to stick with and, and to keep going, even though there is this trend for much paler rosés. Some producers in Tavel are looking to do paler rosés because that is where the, the sort of demand or the interest is but Rich is very much on the opinion that obviously if you start going into that you lose the magic of what makes a Tavel Rosé. Um, so this is his best cuvee, the Prima Donna, is made from older vines and it's a little fuller, a little bit more complex than the, the standard bottling and he's named it after his love of opera which is just um, it's um. very nice isn't it? It's a, it's a, <laughs> a nice kind of um, romanticized idea to the winemaking as well you know it's 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 all very much in harmony and it needs to be and wants to stay that way um, in Tavel but they are very different and it's it's always a surprise at how different they are but you've got the same sort of flavor profile this one is just you know knobs on and it's really much more robust than the Muga but they serve they serve a purpose. I mean, we say a dog's not just for Christmas, a rosé is not just for summer. This is a rosé that would withstand any sort of like slightly heartier stews, ratatouille, anything that's a bit more oomph in its in its food. I mean, the mooga as well, is, there's enough going there that, you know, a lot of seafood, paella, that would be perfect pairing for it. And the nice thing about rosés and why they are such good pairings 
for food is that you've got the freshness of a white wine with the structure and the grip of a, of a, of a red wine. So if you're ever stuck on something to pair, you know, what wine to pair, a rosé is always a good option to go with. But yeah, I have to say I love both of them. But the Tavel for me, I think because like you say, you can you can be a bit more adventurous with what you're pairing it with. Um, and I think I I love the Muga, but it is it's it's fruity and it's friendly and it's sort of almost moving towards a Provence style without being Provence. Um, I think for me, the, the Tavel is such a it's such an iconic wine. It's got its identity. And like you say, because it's had that sort of more intense time, it's almost started life being made as a red wine that got interrupted, yeah. didn't it, really? It, yeah. it began life being produced like a red, where all the, all the other rosés we've got this evening are red grapes that got turned into a white wine, essentially. Mm, so, so this has been made very differently. And because of that, it, it is a bit protected and it can age better. And I agree, you know, I'd like to keep these, you know, a Tavel wine a couple of years, let it get a little bit more herbaceous, a bit more developed. And then you really can pair it with everything. You can pair it with pork, you can pair it with, Absolutely. you know, um, aubergine dishes, chicken dishes, kind of, you know, there's, it's really limitless with a wine like Tavel, but it does have a bit of an identity problem. Yes. And I think as well, perhaps without being snobby about rosé wine, you look at other rosés that are within that colour palette and you're perhaps thinking towards something like a, a white Zinfandel or um, a similar, you know, fruity um, Spanish wine that's, you know, a table wine that is, can be quite, it can absolutely serve its purpose, but it can be sweet and it can be um, not off-putting, but perhaps it can have the effect of making people's perception of the, the colour before they actually get to the taste yeah and I think style. I think most most of the light wines the Provence the Muga wines of that color you expect them to be dry and most of the time they are mm. and then you have more confidence in buying them and I think that's why a lot of people do buy by color because those wines traditionally are usually 99% of the time dry so you can meet your own expectation whereas if you're in a supermarket and you see Tavel on a shelf or if you're in the showroom or, or you know a, a bit easier if you're buying online from us because you would see that the sugar rating but if you saw that next to a exactly as Catherine says white Zinfandel which is a semi-sweet wine um nothing to do with being a white wine made from Zinfandel it's it well it sort of is but it's not um a sort of sickly sweet um wine from from hot parts of California when you saw those two things together the association you're quite right Catherine you start to think well I've had one that looked like that and it was sweet so I'll avoid all wines that look like that and it's such a shame Absolutely. We've just had a, a question come in, which I think is it's an excellent question. And I also love the way it's been worded from Tom Dane. He said, is Mateus Rosé, that icon of the 60s liberation, along with the pill, Carnaby Street, the mini and the mini skirt still produced? I mean, what a way to market. A what rosé. a great question. <laughs> um, it is still produced. It, it has gone under a little bit of a... Um, not a reinvention of itself it's still in the typical Mateus Rosé bottle um it's still an instantly recognizable brand um but I think in terms they've paled of, up haven't they pale, as well they've paled they up have, yeah they have <laughs> gone pale um in, in comparison to what they used to be they they're still on the deeper end but they are um, a little paler than what they are they've they've moved towards what the market wants um and it's worth saying, you know, that 70s, that sort of trend to, you could argue that Mateus was the original rosé, you know, that, that the consumer product, they got to the market before everyone else. So you can't diss, you can't diss it for sure. No, um, duck around for that. And I don't know about you, Catherine, but in my WSCT diploma classes, they tricked us and they gave us one. Did you yes. get one? Oh, yeah. we had one as well. And it's... We got tricked. I said it was very good quality. Yeah. And it is, but what it, it is. is. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Don't knock it, but it is still knocking around. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we've had, oh, Jeff and Jane about how, how long would you age a Tavel Rosé? So so this one, Domain Maybe, they are suggesting around 10 years. Um, obviously, depending on the producer, it will uh, change. But I, I would be confident in saying at least sort of three, three to five years 
for most they're a, to they're a top time. quality Appalachian as well aren't yeah, they Catherine you know absolutely. they're in a, the, one of the best spots in the Rhone they're the only Appalachian in the whole of France that only are allowed to make rosé so it's their specialty yeah. and they they're kind of well they're the best at what they do so um it's quite hard to find a bad one I guess is what I'm saying yeah. um it's strict strict regulations in the AOC that mean that it's quite hard to find a bad one but and they've, they're made with the intention of them being suitable for ageing as well. It's not just a lucky coincidence. It's the, the style of the making is that it will stand up to it. You know, it's got the structure there. It's got the, that's the other thing as well. They're often quite higher alcohol. So this one is 14%, um, which is, is quite high um, for a rosé, but it's very well integrated and it's got the concentration of the flavour there and it's got the, the structural um elements of the, the the tannin as well so it's all very well um sort of blended in together great wines Catherine. thank you shall we move on to the next pair and we'll give uh, those who have still have them in the fridge a, a second to get the next three out is probably the yeah. best thing to do i'm going to be going for the underaga first which is the uh the chilean pinot noir based rosado i'm then going to go for the pure loire and then Catherine's going to be finishing off with the boo bougie. <laughs> bougie boogie. Um, so if you do want to get those three out now, I'm going to grab my bottles to show you the examples because they are lovely bottles, these two. And this guy's just, this Loire guy's just changed his bottle as well. So you, um, you may have seen him in another form. But yes, do grab those. Um, so I'm going to basically be talking about these two as a pair because these two are similar. Um, they're made very similarly, incredibly similarly production wise, but they're made with two different grape varieties. Or I should say one's made with Pinot Noir and one is a blend. Um, so they're obviously from different places, but really we're talking about how how grapes have an, have an impact on, on flavour and colour and all the rest of it as well. So the first one we've got Finca Las Lomas, uh, the Pinot Noir ro Rose. They've got rosé on the bottle. I think we call it a rosado, which is what the Chileans call rosé. So they're obviously looking for an international market if they're calling it Pinot Noir rosé. But hey, hey, um, this is actually an exclusive wine for us. Um, so I'll show you the bottle there, but I think we can probably also pop it up on the screen. Um, in terms of the wine itself, if you are tasting along with us, it is, as I said, 100% Pinot Noir from the Leda Valley, which is in Chile. And I will tell you a little about that in a moment. Um, but they do a few things here with this to keep it lovely and fresh for us. They pick it early. And it's worth saying that that's one of the reasons that the alcohol can stay lower on some of these lighter wines. Sometimes they do choose to pick earlier. Um, one of the reasons is that for that is that red grapes can sometimes lose acidity quite quickly. Pinot Noir is quite good at keeping the acidity, but... A lot of red grapes have a tendency that when they get fully ripe, the acidity drops. And so they pick this nice and early so that they keep the acidity. And to be honest, the reason you wouldn't pick a red wine early to keep the acidity is you would want the skins to be fully developed and tasty. Here, we're not really using the skins. This is one of those, um, those direct press quick, and then a quick maceration. So it's not had much time on those skins. Um, the grapes are hand picked for this wine and really gently pressed. So this, uh, in spite of a slightly darker color, is much lighter, really, really, really light on the nose for me. Very, very refined. Um, the, the juice then, once it's got all the bits out, <laughs> it's then um, pressed and it's aged. Uh, Catherine just mentioned the lees aging, so leaving the dead yeast cells on. Very handy for rosé, stops that, that helps stopping the oxidation as well. Um, that's done for three months. They both are literally made in identical ways. They are both, you know, fermented at a cool temperature in stainless steel, spend three months on the lees, still in stainless steel, don't see any oak, picked young, all the same jazz across both of the wines. So it's a nice comparison. Um, but we wanted to show a wine from a new world country that was still able to provide lots of freshness. Because again, we've mentioned the um, California White Zinfandel sort of disaster fiasco whatever you want to call it there are some good ones out there I'm sure but I'm yet to taste one um th this is beautifully made 
And one of the reasons is, I think we've got a map. Um, this particular wine comes from Leda Valley, which is a sub-region of San Antonio Valley. It's absolutely tiny. I even had to circle it on the map. So there we go. It's that little dot, that little red dot. San Antonio, um, well, the San Antonio Valley is much bigger. It's the little bit in yellow. It sort of touches the Maipo Valley down there. It's nearish to Santiago. But this particular little red dot you can see is, um, is Leda Valley. and it's about 20 to 55 kilometers from the sea. And what that means is the Pacific Ocean, incredibly cold, um, has a beautiful cold current called the Humboldt Current that comes up um, and also brings in lots of fog. So if anyone's had me rabbit on before um, about how that happens up in California in places like Santa Barbara, one of my favorite regions, it happens even more down here. It's really, really cool. Um, it's it's not a place you know it looks very green and gorgeous but it's actually not you know I think in the summer the temperature max temperatures reach something like 22 22 degrees um, Celsius so really doesn't get very hot because of these incredible cooling um, influences and this particular wine and um, vineyard sorry is grown on a west facing um, slope and that literally gets the straight impact of these gorgeous cooling um, cooling coastal yeah, we've got a picture here. So just on the other side of that slope, I believe, stolen this from website, um, is where the, where the um, cool coastal uh, breezes come in and make sure that these grapes stay lovely and fresh. So no jammy rosés here is what I'm saying. So I hope you can have a little smell. I mean, for me, the Pinot is bringing some really nice red berry smells. It's not actually as aromatic as, as you might find for, uh, you know, a red Pinot when it's normally made. I'm getting more mineral on this as well. I don't know about you, Catherine. That kind of stony smell. And then flavour. Oh, yeah. yeah. A little bit like um, tinned mandarins. Mm. A, a mm. slight pithy kind of bitterness that's quite yep. a pleasant bitterness there. A bit like, oh, do I mean Campari? Is that that sort of bitter orange yeah, smell, that yeah. sort of smell? Um, but do have a taste. Flavour-wise for me, it's um, got a kind of nice mixture of, it's got a bit more structure. That Pinot has brought some nice structure to it, but it is still fruity. I would say not as fruity as the Mooga, if we're talking about comparing two direct press wines. I think here we've got a bit more of that savoury note a little bit more of the earthy, um, dare I say it's also a bit more refined. I don't think it packs as much of a punch. Um, so yes, a lovely, again, I put, it would be a garden rosé for me, but I think I'd actually probably like to pair this with something and really bring out some of the fruit. It would work with some quite salty foods. Um, I'm thinking things like salt cod would be delicious. Um, just imagining being on a little Portuguese, yeah, I know it's not Portuguese wine, but having some little bacalao or something with this would be delicious for me. Um, and other things that are going to bring out more of those fruit flavours if you want them. Um, so quite frankly, it would just be some crisps, you know, some ready salted crisps would be really lovely with this. Some nuts can be good sometimes and maybe a little bit challenging other times, but maybe some salted almonds would be nice. I think salted cashews would be too sweet and would would not do the job but some salted almonds or or crisps or something with this would be lovely and yes I'd, I'm keen to hear what you think of that please write in the chat if you've got any thoughts and I'll compare it to the second wine so the second wine is our um it's from the Loire Rosé de Loire um, now, members, if you've been to a tasting with us before or if you've bought this wine before it used to be in quite a square bottle didn't it Catherine yeah, like big, broad, square shoulders. Slightly unpractical for a wine rack. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a great wine rack wine. Um, I also think, actually, um, it's just not a bottle shape that, that perhaps the UK market recognises. Mm. Um, or it's not maybe, I don't know, there's perhaps a little bit of a misconception that they make slightly cheaper wine to put in square bottles, which isn't true. But um, anyway, they've changed the shape. So they have a new shape and a new label, which is here. Um, and this is from, from the Loire, but it's from the Terrain vineyards. So the central section, we do have a map, but I'll get that up in a second. There's no rush because um, I want to get you tasting first. In terms of the grapes here, um, it's 55% Gamay. Now, Gamay, Gamay 
um, you're probably more familiar with in Beaujolais, but there's a lot of Gamay grown in the Loire. And it's actually a really good um, grape to make rosé out of. There's some great rosé in Beaujolais. Um, it makes really fruity wines. So you can smell this one immediately has already got more fruit on the nose for me. It's got, um, it's actually got more like, interestingly, some more, you mentioned just their mandarins. This is more like nectarines to me. It's not super, super red fruits. Um, it's got kind of some peaches and stone fruits and things like that as well. Um, so it's 55% Gamay, 40% Cabernet Franc. And the Cabernet Franc is good for colour when you let it macerate. But this obviously is very pale. It's not been macerating very long. But the other thing it does bring is structure. So there is going to be more structure to this. Gab Gamay traditionally not as good for structure. And then it's got 5% of a grape called Grolu, which is um, going very rapidly out of fashion in the region it can be a bit weak and watery and, and a bit meh um, but actually when it's when it's used well is a very 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 good grape for rosé and historically was a bit what they would mainly make their rosé out of um, so again it's direct press it's got a really low fermentation temperature so we're not um we're not kind of cooking anything we're keeping it all lovely and cool and chilled when we're fermenting and again it's going to sit on those fi five five Ugh, fine leaves, pardon me. Um, it's worth noting that the residual sugar for this is low. It's three grams per litre. Now in Provence Rosé that we had at the beginning, the legal maximum it can be is four grams per litre. So this is, is very much emulating a Provence style, a dry Provence style. So very, very little sugar here. And what do you think of this one, Catherine? I agree. It's very, the, the Cabernet Franc just gives it a little bit more of a, um not too fruity hmm. it's a little I, I don't want to say greenness because that almost sounds like it would be unpleasant in a rosé but it's a sort of a herbal freshness that um it's just it's very kind it's very moorish and it's very quenching and yeah I've got the really nice savory element to it I think it almost makes it more tart as well mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's all, yeah. it's got a kind of bitterness to the end of it that I really like. Mm. Yeah. Do you, is it something you like, Catherine, or just something you? It is. I think yeah. you, for me, I think this means it's much more um, food friendly. Yeah. In comparison to say the um, exhibition plates performance that we had to start, that is very much like a, you know, sip through the afternoon, keep the glass topped up. This is then what I would want to then move on to with a barbecue in the evening. Yeah, it would stand up to a barbecue, wouldn't it? And I think that bitterness and that greenness for me just makes it a bit more serious. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't. Well, I, I would want that at the pool as well. <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I didn't. <laughs> Give me the ball. Um, but I would, yeah, If you're exactly right. I'd probably have the Provence as an aperitif and then this does start to get a bit more complex and a bit a bit more, um, yeah, f food, food for sure. Um, for me, this ironically would go with a lot of Provencal food. So it would go with things like, um, the, I've forgotten the name. Well, I haven't forgotten the name, but I can never pronounce it. Pistolaris, the anchovy bread. Um, it would go with ratatouille. It would go with, yeah, I think it would stand up to a burger actually. And it looks pale as anything. It doesn't look like it should be, should yeah. be worth much at all, you know? And again, it's that preconception pale is weak and, and, and lovely and fruity. And actually this is just, oh, sorry, just proven that this is a pretty serious wine for, for less colour. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, Cabernet Franc will do that. It's a very, really, really powerful wine. And, and um, often in, in Loire doesn't always reach its maximum ripeness either. So Catherine, quite rightly, noticing those green flavours, those kind of leafy. Um, often tomato leaf is a word that people use to describe Cabernet Franc or blackcurrant leaf sometimes as well, the Cabernet family. Um, but yes, so I will, um, oh good, Karen's saying that the Loire is very complex. Yeah, I, think, I really think it is. I think it's a fantastic wine. Um, I will read you a little quote from Olivier, who um, is the, the older generation of the two generations working at um, Fort Grier at the moment. Nicolas is the, the uh, younger guy and they work together, his son, I believe. And he said, in the Loire, we've recently seen that most rosé wines are made through direct pressing of grapes, um, as a, the, the original, the first um, 
production method I mentioned, very quickly getting them off the skins. They are made through direct pressing of grapes having not reached a sufficient maturity, which results in a pale color, but no aromatic intensity. We don't want to make a super pale rosé, which would not be typical of Loire, but in the past few years, we have achieved a paler wine than before, which fits with the consumer demand while retaining maximum flavor. And I think that's exactly what's happened. You know, he's, yes, he's managed to get the color paler than it perhaps traditionally has been, but it still packs a great punch and, and has all that has all the stuff you want absolutely right i'm going to quickly talk for 30 seconds about sweet wines from the loire because we couldn't get one could we catherine with enough stock to to do no. um an example <laughs> and it was so sad because um there are some beautiful sweet roses from the loire and as catherine's going to go on to a very wild wonderful and a favorite of mine a sweet fizzy rose uh finally i'll just quickly mention two rose types that you can get in the Loire which are sweet so if you are buying a rosé from the Loire they're not all like this um they in French they're called rosé tendres and uh the first one is rosé d'Anjou and it is actually made in the style that's quite similar to that white Zinfandel mm -hmm. um it's minimum seven grams per litre of sugar and a minimum of nine percent ABV so alcohol by volume um, you do often find those roses are a little bit lower in alcohol. So rosé d'Anjou might be around 10, 10 and percent normally. Um, they are great with um, things with some sweetness or actually spicy things. So sometimes they're really nice with a curry, um, a hot curry, um, because the, the sweetness, because there is often much more sweetness than seven grams per litre. Um, it will sort of soften the, the heat, the temperature in the chili. And then Cabernet d'Anjou, um, which is actually sweeter, but I would also argue rarer and much harder to get hold of. It has to be 100% of Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, so two very intense red grapes. It can be a blend of those two, but it has to be 100% of the Cabernet family. Um, minimum 10 grams per litre, so it's got a minimum sugar level that's a bit higher. Um, and those ones actually can really age. They tend to produce them in a much more robust way, much more skin contact. What they do to make the sweetness or make the sweetness is not what they do at all. What they do to keep the sweetness, if you imagine that all like all wines start life as sweet wines because they're all grape juice. What they do is midway through the fermentation, so midway through when the, the yeast is converting the sugar to alcohol, they chill it um, and then they'll filter it. And what you get is kind of like a... a a rich sweet rosé um and again usually of an alcohol kind of nine percent ten percent um but the cabernet d'anjou is much harder to get hold of you're probably more likely to get your hands on one of those in france but they're really interesting wines um, and like i said age worthy as well enough about that i'm excited to open the last wine yes. so <laughs> yes. the last one i'll give everyone a moment to open it because obviously it's not as easy as a screw cap or just a, a quick uncorking um, we are going on to the Bougie Cerdon Demi Sec from Carve. Now, this is, I've been practicing this all day. So it's, it's Wodkawiak. It's Carve Wodkawiak. Um, luckily, the winemaker and the, um, the vineyard owner, he's called Jonathan. So we're going to refer to him as Jonathan this evening. It's just easier for all of us. <laughs> so let everyone pop their bottles and pour a little glass. I'm going to have a little sip now. This is one that I don't think I'll necessarily bother with the spittoon for <laughs> because it is so delicious. And just to address that, Roger, about no bandol tonight. Again, while we were putting the case together, there wasn't a bandol in stock. We had a real adventure trying to, <laughs> to get a nice selection of rosés um, that matched everything. But we do have a lovely bandol in stock at the moment. Perhaps Tim might be able to pop that into the chat. Um, we could do this again, Catherine. We could do Rosé so Part many. 2 and cover off all the things we didn't manage to, <laughs> to fit in. Absolutely. Except White Zinfandel. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have one, so we're okay there. <laughs> so hopefully everyone that has a bottle has now been able to pour themselves a little glass, a little sample. And I mean, look at that colour. It's it's just glorious, isn't it? I, if you still have a little bit of the Tavel left... You can do a slight comparison in colour. Tava was ever so slightly more on the orange tone. This is much more of a, a real cherry red um, 
in the, the the boogie reminds me of Vimto. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's one that's it's a, again a really surprising wine um, and really interesting and fun and delicious. So let's let's get to it. So this is the the Bougie, um Zedon. It's a method ancestral and it's a demi sec. It's eight percent in alcohol, and we've given it a four out of nine in terms of sweetness. So that's probably going into your um, off dry to medium sweet sort of style. It's a blend of 80% Gamay and 20% Pulsar, which is a dark skinned, um, big, juicy grape variety from the Jura. And it is um, Gamay and Pulsar are the only permitted grape varieties in the Boogie wine growing area. So this area covers nearly 500 hectares in the Anne department. Um, we'll stay on this map for, for a moment just while we'll have a look. So it's in the secondary mountain range of the South Jura Massive and it stretches over uh, Serdon, Montague and Belly. Now I've tried to do a little zoom in of the map. So if you look on the, the map on the right hand side, you should be able to see just to the left of where it says Con, Conlige, Conligi. You've got Montague, so it's all in that little area there, but it is quite small, so small in fact that not all of the information is on the map, unfortunately. But it's it's from the Jura, um, which again is a, a region that I know I don't drink enough wines from, and one that you perhaps wouldn't necessarily find um, just on the shelf without having a, a little bit of a route around and a look. So Wodkawiak, Carve Wodkawiak is, here we go, we've got a lovely picture here, of the farm. So it's run now by Jonathan and he took over from his parents a few years ago. They had been farming for the past 30 years um, and they you know, were, were farming um, arable as well as livestock. They had cows and sheep um, and they had the, the vineyards as well that were, were planted 30 years ago, just over four hectares. If we're able to bring the image of the um, the farm back up very quickly you should see that there's some of the vineyard area is sort of directly around the there we go to the to the right of the farmhouse as you're kind of looking at it so luckily there's about 2.2 hectares of the vineyard directly sort of adjacent to the farmhouse um, and then the other areas of vineyard are a little bit further uh, further away but it makes it very nice because it's Jonathan that works it in its entirety. The wine that he has chosen to make is a is the Method Ancestral um, sparkling wine, but it's more of an effervescence. It's it's more of a, a froth than a fizz um, in in the style, and it's really pleasant. It's a really nice style of wine. I will quickly just go over what the method ancestral is, if not um, everyone is necessarily as familiar with it. It's thought to be the oldest method. It's actually thought to have been um, accidentally discovered by Benedictine monks um, as they were left some wine out on the side and didn't actually mean for it to go fizzy as it did. But it's a, it's a very old method um, and perhaps the most natural method for making a sparkling wine none of the liqueur, which is the, the sugar or the, and the yeast um, or any sort of extra little additives are added to start the second fermentation. So the process will start traditionally with alcoholic fermentation of just the grape juice after pressing the, the grapes. But the fermentation process is paused. It's not allowed to go through to completion. So after about two weeks, when they've reached a, a certain level, maybe about five degrees alcohol, they will um, halt the action of the yeast, they'll lower the temperature in the vats, which means that the yeast will just remain dormant. And then they will filter the wine for the first time and bottle it. They store the bottles in the cellar at about 10 degrees. And then as the wine comes back up to temperature from being cooler to stop the fermentation, fermentation, it will come back up to temperature to get to the temperature of the cellar. The yeast that is still in the bottle will reactivate. 
So the alcoholic fermentation resumes which results in the form, formation of the um, of the bubbles. So it's the, the CO2 is then released. So that is then the bottle fermentation. Then after about two months, when they've got to the uh, desired pressure, the bottles are opened again, they are emptied out, the bottles are rinsed and the filtered wine is poured back in and then corked. So it's a really nice, lightly sparkling wine. Like I say, it's a gamay, so we've already spoken about the um, the sort of fruits that you're getting from that. It's a real cherry bomb, sort of ripe strawberry. It's very pure fruit, this. There's no other sort of secondary characters from, um, from the making of the wine. It's not a wine you would want to age. The Pulsard is a grape that makes a very sweet, juicy, um, is a a vine that makes very sweet juicy grapes which then result into the juice as well so it just amps up the the ripeness and the sweetness and the juiciness and it does add to the color as well to get that really lovely color and i've seen a few people are saying how well it's going with strawberries and it really does it's it's absolutely a, i mean this would be perfect to take to wimbledon you know you could just it's light enough that you can enjoy it for the afternoon it goes very well with um, soft summer fruit say if you had like a summer pudding that would be a delicious pairing um, and the other really nice thing about the effervescence is that if you are having a dessert um, that's got some more aeration in it so perhaps like a sorbet or an ice cream because you've also got aeration in the wine it counteracts really nicely together having said that you can also like with the rosé d'anjou look at having something a little bit more um, spicy, a little bit more flavorful on a savory note. So one of the things that they suggest having with this wine is um, Cajun fritters. And I suppose that sort of, that style of spice, that kind of fruity spice would go really nicely with this. So it's definitely one that I will, I will be trying, but I do. Well, have after you told me that Catherine, I decided that that's what I was going to do this evening because mm -hmm. it won't keep, you know, that, that light fizz that you've mentioned isn't the sort of thing that you can it needs to be drunk tonight what a shame Absolutely. um so, so i'm gonna try it with a penang curry nice. i know it's not the same but it's all that i had after you told me that piece of information <laughs> so that's what i'm i'm trying it with this evening it could be hit it could be miss i don't know but at least i know the wine will be nice um but yes i think it's a um it i think it's a an unusual unusual little beast isn't it and we, we've mentioned before, Catherine, it's quite a good wine to have early on in the day. Some might say for breakfast. <laughs> it is one that we, we have just described as a breakfast wine. Um, and it is, you know, if you're going to have a Bucks Fizz, why not have a, a Boogie served on instead? Have that with your bacon sandwich. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think that's it's a new alternative to the Bucks Fizz. No faffing around with orange juice and, and carver for me. I'm just going to get bottles of this while ready. Absolutely. Oh, what a lovely wine to end on. It's such a pleasure. I'm really glad that you did that, Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> it's a very nice one. It's, um, yeah, it looks like there's been some real mixed bags in the chat about a favourite. I think we may have a poll. We have a poll. I'm just going to launch it now. So we've put them in the order. So if, you, if you've had too many, uh, too many Tavelles and you need to just remember number wine number four, then don't worry. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six all lined up here. And I'll launch it now and we'll let it run for a couple of seconds. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely lovely um, sharing this evening with you, Catherine. I think we will have to do Rosé round two because there is a lot to cover. It's um, There's a lot going on in the world of Rosé and um, it would be a shame to miss out some of our favourites. Even... Even within Provence, I mean, we've had this chat, Catherine, you know, um, for anyone interested, for example, in a Provence with a bit more oomph to it, um, we sell the most incredible wine made by a producer called Van Law. Um, I will grab the link up now, actually, because it's worth mentioning. Um, and, you know, they, they, they're they kind of bucking the trend slightly. And actually, they I think they've even made their wine slightly darker. Um, just to show that it's full of flavour, but we could easily do six wines from, from Provence and they'd all taste differently, or at least six wines from, from the south of France, uh, roses from the south of France, because if we'd gone into the Languedoc, for example, where they make a lot of single single uh, varietal wines, which, which Provence isn't allowed to do, 
um, you know, we'd be having all sorts of weird and wonderful things. We could have had a Merlot rosé from Languedoc for all we know. So the world of rosé is our oyster. Right, <laughs> let's end the poll and I will show the results. So the winner was the Tavel, Catherine. There oh, you go. Cool. Good. No wimpy wines here for our members, that's for sure. <laughs> And coming up second, the Loire Pure um, from Fa uh, Famille Bourrier. So again, I think a really good, strong wine. Um, but I'm delighted that everything got a vote, which is always what we hope for. And it just shows there's a rosé for all occasions. Oh, there is, there is. We've Well, we've decided breakfast, aperitif before lunch. Oh, we could probably put these in a sort of chronological order throughout <laughs> one day, couldn't we, Catherine? <laughs> oh what a day that would be well thank you all so much for your time um i've really really enjoyed it i hope you have too um if anyone has any other questions on rosé catherine i would be happy to answer those over email i know we've run over slightly so i do apologize um but i hope you've enjoyed the wines the mix case that we did put together for the tasting is sold out but my understanding is that all of the wines are still individually available to buy that's right isn't it catherine yes they are yes. so so especially if you like something or if you want to get yourself six Tavelles and keep them for a few years and see what happens, then I would strongly recommend it. What a lovely thing to do. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Tim, behind the scenes. Thank you, members, for joining us. And I'm going to go and enjoy a glass of my delicious new version of Buck's Fizz whilst I um, finish off my curry. Excellent. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>